weeks, and that's what we for. Well, thank you very much. I've actually never shown a video before, <laughs> and so it's here at the beginning. Uh, if you look at the screen, you can see, actually you see something that looks like it's out of Alien. <laughs> but I don't know how many of you noticed, this is a bowling ball. Okay. So now let's see, let's see if we can actually see it go. Okay, so that, that's a bowling ball falling quite a long distance and then hitting the ground. It will, here's a slightly brighter one. I didn't take, I wasn't there when this was taken. So I just got this. It, it's taken about a year for this to get declassified. <laughs> uh, and I still don't have the numbers behind it. But I also love the soundtrack, so that, that one doesn't have a sound. Just let me, let me play the very beginning for you. So that, that's in real time. <laughs> so uh, you'll, you'll see this come back when I, when I try to talk about it. We have the lights back now. Thank you. So what I really want to talk about this morning is, is issues about communicating science, and particularly communicating climate-like tasks, right? difficult tasks. And this, you know, addressing climate-like questions, it, it requires doing science in the dark. Like with weather forecasts, we, we make a forecast, we see the results. We make a forecast, we see the results. Our models live many, many, many forecast times. With climate-like tasks, very often the lead time of the forecast is longer than the lifetime of the model. Right? And so it's a different kind. It puts different restrictions on how we do it. But it's not just geophysicists who do this. There's similar climate-like questions in nuclear stewardship, Novel engineering design, building something for the first time, national intelligence, America's Cup design, these other issues. And scientists in these cases are forced to violate what statisticians would say are traditional best practice skills. We don't have any choice. It's the nature of the question that requires this change. And so it's not really fair to complain about that. We can't wait 50 years for an out of sample 50 year forecast. And it's just a brute fact that climate models' lifetime is less than the forecast lead time. Okay? So that doesn't mean that the physics underlying the fact that CO2 in the atmosphere is going to warm the planet is about as good as science gets. But it, it does mean that we have, well, it does mean that it might be in our interest to be a, a little more careful about the way we draw on strength of evidence, the sort of levels of confidence and uncertainty we express about the results. And other groups working on this that I've talked to uh, the, 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 the video you just saw was from a nuclear stewardship test that I'll come back to. I mean, they sometimes brace this attempt to find out and understand ways of dealing with model inadequacy, the shortcomings of their models, uh, in ways that, 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 are, that are less obvious in climate science. So clarity before consensus, this is, this is picking more back up to the question of communicating the science. Whether or not when we're trying to make these communication documents, we're really trying to be clear about what we know or believe, or we're really trying to make sure we maintain consensus, even at the cost of clarity. So if this is before or above, you know, it, it, my, my aim is clarity is often of more value to people using the outputs of science than, than the fact that we've managed to find something we all agree on. Now I have a lot of trouble <laughs> deciding on titles, and this has all been done in the last 48 hours, so uh, in fact, I, I couldn't really decide which title to use. I think I would really like Good Karma Climate Science Communication. So the idea that by taking a more pedagogical, open, friendly approach to people who ask 
questions that seem very naive, this can also be a very positive thing in terms of building a wider base of support and understanding. This sort of goes along with the lines, can climate scientists play nice, right, or maybe nicer, because I think we, we sometimes suffer from very fun disputes which really don't communicate what, what we might want to, commute to the, communicate to the audience. So back to the aliens theme, this would be, you know, in model land, no one can hear you scream. <clears throat> so very often, I want to go do some experiment. Right? Someone asks a question, I think, hey, we can really show this easily with CMIP3 or CMIP5. And then I start doing the experiment, and I get this sinking feeling as I realize that I can do it, but... I have to make jumps that I really hadn't realized I was going to have to make. So I'll show some examples of that. So, so this was originally Judy Curry's talk. I, I really would have liked to hear Judy. Hi, Judy. Uh, thank you, Judy. <laughs> I really enjoy talking with Judy, and I, I learn a lot from talking to Judy. And I, I think that's one of the, one of the things that, that I find interesting is the different ways different people interact. Right? And I'm really sorry you're not here. So... Uh, I would have gone to the banquet dinner last night if you were here. <laughs> okay, so one of the points in that direction is, you know, do we agree on more than we agree on? And I think very often in discussion, we end up not actually agreeing on things where we really do agree. We, we talk about the probability of X conditioned on I, the information, and we may argue tremendous about, tremendously about the probability of X, but we're actually conditioning on different I's. <laughs> And I think some clarity there might really help, especially those outside our community. And the first night that we were here, there was a public thing, and one of the, one of the speakers started by saying, we're not here to discuss whether or not 2 plus 2 equals 5, it equals 4, right? Thinking about, you know, if, if, it, if you think it equals 5, you're stupid. So there, there are a lot of people who might think it might be 5, you know, 2 plus or minus a half plus 2, plus, I don't know. <laughs> And, and again, it, it doesn't mean, I, I would like to make the argument that even if, it, even if it, it, sometimes it's useful not to think that that means someone's stupid. So again, this is the same thing in pictures. Wouldn't it be nice if we could move from this, right? So who do you want to be in this picture, <laughs> right? I mean, there's no real good choice, <laughs> even if you win, to something a little bit more like this. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, this, this is a more alien theme and, and predator playing chess. <laughs> so this is less fun to watch, but very often it, it communicates a lot of the underlying material, I think, better. Okay, so I think I've said most of this. Uh, while I enjoyed Gavin's AGU lecture very, very much, I don't want to advocate. This is one point of, you know, I, I think it's very clear you can use science to motivate and you can try to use science, communicate science to inform. And I really want to try to stay on this science to inform, which means I really want to clarify certain facts. I'll use examples like anomalies. And I think I want to lower the bar just because climate-like problems are harder. Okay? And so, again, when I do this, I occasionally get this sort of sinking feeling, right? You can, you can think about the Righteous Brothers. You can think about the theme from Alien. You know, this, this is our, oops, that doesn't quite come out. But uh, if you look at the, it's hard to tell what this thing in the poster for, for today's, for this meeting is. There's a lot of IPCC in the Shirley's, right? This is the sort of thing that happens. You, start, you get a statistician asks you a question, you go to start doing it, then it suddenly turns out there are little things in the actual archive or the way the experiments were designed which don't quite match up. Surely it doesn't matter. Right? I've taken most of these out, but there are about 10 of these things that I think are quite interesting. So it really doesn't ma matter, perhaps, but clear experimental design is just good basic practice. We also have discussions like we had here the other day where Gavin says, my model is not purple, and, and Gavin is an honorable man, so are they all, all no, it's a good karma talk. So we, we don't need to argue over math questions that really aren't relevant to the output. So I, I started with this slide, and then I realized, thinking about Eric's talk, that, well, maybe we do need to argue closely over the math questions that really are relevant, but we, we, it, you know, we, can, we can resolve a lot of that very, very quickly by thinking about the kinds of models that we're really using. And then going back to the title, this idea of, come on, tell us what you really think, can we really get more information? There's a lot of, there, 
I, I've been asked questions that I would think would be useful to have the answers to, which, which some discussion must have been made, but I haven't found that traceable path that I was hoping to find in discussions of uncertainty. So let's go back to the question of what was the video about? Now, people doing nuclear stewardship haven't been able to blow up a bomb in a long time. And they're really concerned about trying to understand model inadequacy in other situations, which might give them a hint about what's going on. So maybe we could learn something by dropping a ball from a tower and seeing how well we can estimate how long it takes the ball to fall. So this is, this, the, the, what is the next slides are thanks to Dave Higdon at Los Alamos. This is Dave. <laughs> Uh, at, in Las Vegas, the night before, we went down to explore where this experiment was going to be done. So normally I ask, how accurately do you think we could predict the time it takes a ball, a basketball, say, to fall a long distance? So the first thing I had to learn was, in Los Alamos, when they drop balls, they don't, the tower is at the top. There's a 1,000-foot shaft called UA1. We're going to drop the ball down this shaft. We dropped two bowling balls, three basketballs, two golf balls, three wiffle balls. I really wanted to drop a rubber duck, <laughs> but it didn't get clearance. So there's no rubber duck. <laughs> this is where we were. Area 51 is not on the map, but it's up here somewhere. We were in Area 1. And this is us after a day in Las Vegas, day and a half in Las Vegas, trying to do this calculation with uncertainty characterization. And this is the basketball. OK? So we're down here at the bottom of the shaft with our breathing apparatus and our hard hats and everything, trying to see, you know, is there anything we want to think about? And we come up with these distributions. Now, in, in, in other lectures, I actually have clickers out there so you could vote on this. How accurately do you think we were? We were this is a basketball, initial velocity zero, a thousand foot tower. We've got laser sheet. I mean, the timing is incredible. The instrumentation is, I don't think they're able to see it, right? And when I asked this question, <laughs> this is a result I got from a, set of, from, a, from, a, from a seminar in London. So no one thought we were within a hundredth of a second. Most people thought we were here. I was really surprised that some people thought we were over a minute. But that's for my students and postdocs in the room. <laughs> when we asked the same question at Linda's meeting at NCAR, this went away. Now, that kind of statistical manipulation is exactly the, I've got this sinking feeling, kind of, right? I've seen the results. I understand why, and I want to change the statistics. So I'm, I'm going to put those back, right? But I will mention that in an experiment with naive subjects, very smart naive subjects, at NCAR, no one said this. So I, I still don't have the numbers. They haven't been declassified. I do have my radiation exposure chart, which mailed to me last week. But I couldn't have made up an S, I couldn't have made up numbers that were better than this, right? The bowling ball was completely destroyed. Not the one I showed you. One of the basketballs failed to make it to the bottom. <laughs> now, in all of our calculations, we never considered the possibility <laughs> that someone would have to rappel down the shaft to find the basketball. <laughs> right? My students knew this. That's why that other statistic was biased. So this is a big surprise. It's when something your model doesn't reflect turns out to be important. Right? We thought surface roughness of the balls was going to be the real thing that caused this difficulty. And sometimes we can estimate this probability of a big surprise. We can't estimate it inside the models, of course. Right? The idea is it's something that the models are lacking. So let me take a step further back. You know, again, I want to put this in a broader context. This is not saying there are problems with climate-like problems, much less saying there's problems with climate science. When Kevin, Kelvin was talking about the age of the Earth, he more or less said, look, the sun is not going to last for millions of years into the future unless sources now unknown to us are prepared in the great storehouse of creation. So this I like to call Kevin's, Kelvin's gambit. Why is it Kevin, right? This clarification, conditioning on the information where he's making the statement, assuming no one discovers nuclear energy in 50 years, right? this strengthens a scientific argument. And I think providing that kind of background information, if it turns out that our doubts about the accuracy of had cm 3 along the lines of, well, maybe an asteroid will hit the Earth, 
if that's the main uncertainty, then that gives me a certain, that gives me a much, I'm much more able to interpret the diversity of those ensembles. Right? But it turned out it wasn't skin roughness that was the problem with the dropping balls. So here's another example. This is Leverrier. Leverrier is extremely famous for having discovered Neptune with mathematics by looking at perturbations in Uranus's orbit. I learned this in high school, maybe junior high. I was in graduate school and maybe my postdoc before I learned that he also discovered the planet Vulcan. Very similar awards and celebrations happened when the planet was discovered, and of course it doesn't exist. Right? Newton's laws fail when you get too close to the sun. So Whitehead has this nice discussion of the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, where he discusses the limitations of thinking too much inside, in this case it's an analytic model or conceptual framework, but computer simulation I think holds some of the same problems. But my bigger picture question is, why do we so rarely communicate this story early in science education? I think the fact that we don't causes lots of problems later when we try to have rational discussions about the limitations and usefulness of models and all the things that were, you know, at the, 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 many of the talks have been with models are never perfect, blah, blah, blah. Right? If we were teaching Vulcan and Neptune at the same time, that's, that would be an easier sell. In the same way, Lawrence talked about intellectual phase locking. If, you have, if you're trying to do an experiment, you look for systematic errors over and over and over until you get close to the right value, and then you stop. Right? Now, this is not a, just a problem with climate science. This is a documented problem for estimating the speed of light, which in some sense is out there. How much more of a problem is it going to be for something like climate sensitivity? I think we just, you know, just, just being open to this kind of error and uncertainty is useful. Okay? <clears throat> so these, again, this is just to say this problem is much wider than climate science. These are the people that I talk to. When do I get the sinking feeling? Well, scenarios or schematics. So this is a schematic we saw the other day. This is a great schematic. All the things in the schematic really exist. They sort of show us how to pull things together. We can think about ideas by looking at the schematic. Here's another schematic. Okay. This shows that in our climate models, we've included turtles and some dolphin-shark hybrid, but <laughs> mountains and ice and snow. So a Norwegian insurance company might ask, under climate change, am I going to get more snowfall on this side, where Bergen is, or on the other side, or everywhere. But then when we look at what the resolution of had CM3 is, let's just take the height of a point on the planet and subtract off the corresponding height on the had CM3 grid, we see something like this. All the structure you see in here is what is not in had CM3. Right? This mountain range, which you can see, right, this, is, this is truth minus the height assigned to this grid point. So the mountain, I mean, Norway is hardly a couple of, of grid points. The idea that we can think, pose our questions based on this schematic is somewhat misleading when we realize, and then it's not that it's somewhat misleading. The insurance company sees this, understands, and then they, well, why was I, you know, they, they feel they've been, mis maybe perhaps, or they decide not to do the study for whatever reason. So this is the difference between things that we've included. No doubt there is a variable, maybe even a subroutine for sharks and turtles, and things that are realistically simulated, including things like the laws of physics. What's another one? Well, when anomalies aren't identified as anomalies, or when they're hidden, or when they're said to be within the observational noise, or when it's suggested that they're just not important. So here is anomalies not only translated to Fahrenheit, but called temperature and the US Global Change Research Program. That's, uh, I, I don't understand, right? I can understand what anomalies are, but these really are, it's the same graph, right? It's just been fixed. And these are anomalies, they're not temperatures. And if the range which we're correcting is like three degrees and we're worried about changes of two degrees as being dangerous, I don't think we can say these are unimportant for adaptation, for understanding what impacts are likely to be. This is the graph from the AR4. These are all model anomalies on top of each other with the observations. This is the range of the actual model runs. 
It's about three degrees. If you take out the running mean from 1900 to 1950, the data collapse down like this. Right? But people who are used to thinking this is the sort of resolution we get for adaptation issues, right? Then what this shows is that, in the previous slide, a wide range of sort of Earth-like planets, all warm by about the same amount, given this CO2 forcing. For mitigation, that may be enough. In fact, one might argue that for mitigation, we had enough before we even saw this generation of models. But for adaptation, this is a nonsense. Can I, can I, so, can I right. so the global mean does not respond to the global mean uh, temperature. Right? So the, uh, the distribution of temperatures on a, on a model around the world goes from uh, minus 16 to plus 30 every single minute, every month, every year, right? The, uh, when you're looking at how the planet itself responds to feedbacks, you're looking at how that whole range responds to feedbacks. A difference of one or two degrees on that spectrum is actually completely negligible. So I, I'm happy to talk about, in the question period, I'm really happy to talk about things like infrared to space, whether or not you can linearize over three degrees, issues like that. I'm just saying there's this wide variety of actual things that are called global mean temperature, and that is not clearly communicated to the people who are trying to then take and use the data, right? It's better communicated in the AR5. Here what we have, we still don't have the showing them, but here on the right-hand side, with a different scale and a different length, we actually have the offsets you'd have to add to this to get back to this point. But we've also note that the anomaly period has changed. So now things agree more in here. So this is a question of experimental design. How, how often do we start shifting the anomaly period? Right? Why is this done? Why don't we stay with just one? And there, there, there are a number, I'll, I'll come back to that, right? Okay. So, so I, 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 if, if you object to the details analysis, which Gavin might, I just drop back to the fact that in the first report, they're called temperatures. They're not called anomalies, right? That's enough to create a lot of distrust. Now, <clears throat> lower bounds being identified as such in the peer-reviewed literature are then taken to be estimates. So here's a, 19, a 2008 value, here is 2011. Now we're actually trying to reduce uncertainties, but we know, right? So this is by James Murphy, who also wrote the lead on other reports, the UKCP09 report. It's important to stress we're only getting a range of the possible structural errors. So for structural error, this is only a lower bound. We can't sample it. This is from the AR4. Limitations implied distributions of future climate respond to ensemble simula sim simulations are themselves subject to uncertainty and would be wider. Right? So the distributions that we get out if we were to sample structural uncertainty better, if we weren't running everything on 2014 hardware, those distributions would be different and we know they're different today. So in that sense, our, P our probabilities are not mature. We can expect them to change without learning anything deep about the planet or observations. So what does that mean? That means the structural uncertainty, less a lower bound, could be this big, could be this big, right? For all we know, this piece of the pie is bigger than the other pieces combined. A lower bound of models that run on 2014 hardware is not an estimated value. And yet we turn around and use it that way. So model diversity is one lower bound on structural uncertainty. We know these probabilities aren't mature. That doesn't mean they're useless. That doesn't mean the simulations aren't useful. But it means that if they are presented to people who try to use them as if they are mature probabilities and make decisions based upon them, and then they learn this, and then they look in the footnotes and find that it actually is agreed, they get the sinking feeling. I think it was better for climate-like sciences, all of them, if we try to avoid that happening. Here's another case that Reto showed me, and I don't really have time to talk about it, but this is sea ice. I'm not arguing that details about the temperature, global mean temperature, are different, right? They're that, that in some, surely it doesn't matter. I've got four Shirley's on this one. What I'm arguing is that for these runs, <laughs> there's still lots of ice down here at the end of the century. And for these runs, there's not ice at all. And if, as one of the people I was talking, is interested in Coast Guard stations in the north, there's no way to sort of normalize this out. 
these local effects are non-trivial. Okay. So, okay, maybe this is just, so now I'm going to actually turn completely around <laughs> and try to talk about a discussion we, we, we almost had last week with the BBC reporter and just sort of say, look, instead of just saying no, maybe just go where they are and try and follow through their thought space. Pedagogically, if they ask a weird question, it's sometimes useful to try and answer that question. We can, no, that's not what we did. I understand. They understand. Yes, 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 yes. But that's not the way it's done in the AR5. Sure. Maybe even the BBC reporter understands that. But why resist looking at the problem from another angle? So th this, this is based on a real discussion that I didn't finish because Anna and Erica did this in the last 48 hours. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not claiming that we have to do this, but I'm talking about good karma communication. I think this is a good way. What? Here's the question. It's extremely likely that more than half the observed increase in global average surface temperature was caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations, right? So this statement has been widely misunderstood in very silly ways. This is the graph we drew. This is actually Erica who insists on, uh, Erica is actually, her thesis introduces the hawk moth, which will go away. Right? The point is that more than a half, the statement says there's 95% chance of being up here. Less than a half, there's 5%. A common misconception is it's 5%, it's not happening, not us, something. But the point is, here at 49, 49% being us, that's still in this 5%. Right? There is a huge amount of human impact even on this side. This is not widely understood. Right? So you can, you can try to explain what this means. Gavin has a very nice distribution, but the question was, but the models don't look like that. But the models don't look like that. But the models don't look like that. So what do the models look like? Well, we take Gavin's graph and we stretch it. Oh, first this is just saying, this is how my whiteboard corresponds to Gavin's graph. Right? So clearly, from the distribution, and this, this curve is derived from the conclusions of the AR5 in a completely reasonable way, but that's not the question that was bothering our, our reporter. So one thing to note, of course, is that expert judgment ends up bumping up. This is a vanishingly small tail probabilities. So there's some expert judgment here that actually increases this to 5%. They're interested in understanding how that went. They want that traceable account of how these things were redone, but I didn't get that far. What Anna did yesterday, maybe Friday, was to take the linear implied change from 2005 to 1951 of all the model ensembles. So these are different models. These are the different changes between 2005 and 1951. Okay? And now I'm going to take Gavin's graph. I know what the temperature change was. I'm just going to convert this into temperature. And I'm going to look at the half height and how it corresponds to the model runs. And the BBC person says, I'm making this up. See, they're still completely different. Hey, look, they're not even exchangeable. These guys are really, really hot. All these guys are cold somewhere. You can't, you can't really talk about putting Gaussian distributions on this. And that's, you know, but that's not what was done. The argument was about the fraction of attributable change in each model, not the absolute temperature. So we have to rescale the changes so that this, this one here, again, makes sense. And when we do that, we actually get graphs which really make pretty much sense. You can't pull attribution out of this graph. This doesn't look at the fingerprinting at all. But it takes someone who comes into the room saying, the models are in complete disagreement, and it says, no, no. Here's how they agree. And then they say, well, what is this linear implied change? Just show me the 2005 to 1905. So linear implied change is, is another one of these harsh, this is a handle for saying, if we call this a linear trend, statisticians will object, because you can reject the null that this is a linear, that there's a line with IID noise on it, but it, that's why we use this silly name. But let's go ahead, let's show her the, the thing, let's show her the distribution. Things are wider, but that's exactly what you'd expect, because now you've got all this noise from just sampling values. But the interpretation, there's still no massive disconnect here. And then maybe she'll invest enough to read about fingerprinting and how, the, and how the calculation goes on. But she doesn't. She says, well, why are you using 2005? Why not 2010? And I get this sinking feeling. <laughs> so it turns out in the C5 experimental design, there's a break point at 2005 where things are done a different way. 
Surely this does not matter. You know, I think that's right, but that's a hook I can't dodge, right? For, for the anti-science library, this annoys the statisticians. So my point here is careful, coherent experimental design is basic good practice. But what I'm really trying to do is saying by engaging by someone who might have thought that 2 plus 2 equals 5, and say, well, it's 2 plus 2 plus or minus 0.1, it really doesn't equal 5. We're just walking through that, we actually get, I think it aids the, un the basic understanding of what's going on. So clearly, right, we, we already know the questions were, we know the questions before we look at the output, right? That's basic design. It's a fifth assessment. I would expect most of the questions are completely frozen, they're extremely specific, and we're looking at how they evolve as we move forward in time. So then, two more things. This question toward moving towards actionable, credible, transparent, applied science. This rhetorical sword crossing, it, it's a lot like this, right? Steve Coonan writes a Wall Street Journal piece. Ian Foster at the University of Chicago was the first person on, on the list that I looked to to talk to me about pointing out some of these things were strictly true, but very misleading factoids. And then Ray, on my slate, write sort of a slam dunk rebuttal, which it sort of slams the relevance as well as the weak claims in one go. There's some claims in here which are along the lines of, hey, look, there's a very wide range of anomalies. Maybe that makes a difference. That one could be explained. Cherry picking statistics, that could be explained very easily. Okay, so what I'd like to consider so how many knows what Chatham House is? And so Chatham House is really a place, downtown London, and it has one rule. They're not Chatham House rules, there's only one. And that's that when you come out, you can talk about what was discussed inside, but you can't say who said what. And this is one of the things the Brits just did really, really well, right? It's really impressive to hear what people will say inside that building. Uh, so maybe we could have that kind of discussion to make fairly simple statements. I believe that there are many things, many, many things that all of us would admit at the level of one in 200. Okay. And I also think that there are not that many things that we'd insist were going to happen at a probability much, much higher than one in 200. It would be interesting to know. Right? So if, it was, if the statements were worded by a neutral party, then I think Judy, Gavin, Ray, many, many people would agree on statements as long as it were carefully clear that we were talking about the probability of X conditioned on I. Our P can change with the I. And, and you can often see cases where people have different assumptions and therefore they argue about the conclusions, but they don't necessarily disagree if we actually don't talk past each other and look at exactly the same sentences. So, in that situation, we might be able to drop, I don't mean ignore completely, right? Discussions of things we agree that are much, much less than one in 200 or much, much greater than 10%. And then refine and report the diversity of views on those things that are near the threshold. And demonstrate a much wider level of unity. And every now and again, there's gonna, really is gonna be something where we disagree or where a small number of people disagree and have an argument. And then we can have some coherent minority report but not something that sort of shoots at similar questions, something that focuses on exactly the question, the same X, the same I, and the reasons why we have differences of opinion about what the probabilities are. Not greater than 66% or greater than 95% or greater than 99% with 40 people saying greater than 99 and one person saying greater than 66, consensus is greater than 66. Discuss, discuss there actually, there really is a difference whether you think this is above or below and why. Or just see if we can come up with a several different points of view and who, who or what fraction of a reasonable class agree with those. That's what's done with, the, with banks. This is my student Liam. No, this is my student Liam. Solvency 2 is a set of rules for future banks. Liam wrote part of this text. And they do something just like this. They don't try to get a whole PDF they more or less try to decide these are the ones they argue about. They're legally constrained to do things if the probability is more than one in 200. They don't really worry too much about these. Some of them do, but they think it gives them an advantage. But they talk a lot about these, this sort of level. I'm not saying we need one in 200. I'm just saying we need to be more precise about our X and our I. So here's the situation of another statement 
This, this in short, is saying there's a reasonable probability that the real world is going to fall in, in terms of global mean temperature change at the end of the next century with additional technical constraints is going to fall outside the range of the models. Right? Not a huge probability, but more than one in 200. Now, now, that has lots of implications if you're trying to do low probability of failure calculations. You can't downscale any of them. If you downscaled all of the models, right, you would still expect that there's more than a 1 in 200 probability that reality would fall outside the range you got. I think it's fair to say that this statement could be interpreted as saying the probability of a big surprise in GMT average over the last 20 years of the century is something like 1 in 10, maybe 1 in 4. It depends a lot on where you put that probability. Do you put it above the model range? Do you put it below the model range? Do you, do you spread it equally? I, my intuitive feeling is that the people coming up with, this, with, with increasing that probability outside the range didn't all think it was symmetric. They did, the majority of them didn't think it was below. I would have thought that because of the kinds of feedbacks we're likely to miss, they may be more likely to be positive than negative, and it may be more likely to be hotter than the range than colder than the range. What I think doesn't really matter, what would be useful is not to know the consensus. We could agree on this 66%, but to know that nine out of 10 people thought it was going to lie above or below, to have some more clear information about where that extra probability mass, when it gets moved out, goes to. Okay. Uh, again, the AR5, this is a lot, there's a lot, but this kind of a discussion is a lot better and this is just what I said, uh, it'd be nice to know what the distribution of belief about where that extra probability was. And also, in a public panel at the AAAS, I was trying to ask this question, but the response from friends and colleagues and senior people was, an adjustment was needed in the AR4, that's the 60-40 rule, but we didn't need to make that kind of adjustment in the AR5. So now this is, a public, this is a public meeting, not really a science meeting. We don't want to get into a fight about something where I could give them the page number. Right? It's just, if we embrace this fact that this quote is in the AR5, right, it, it, would, be, it would be easier to think about, it, it, would, it would make those sorts of discussions in public smoother and we would, be, we would be held to have more confidence in my view. The same way, until this year, Okay, so in the, in, the, in the AR4, right, when we're, looking, when we're looking at temperatures in 2100, I think it actually is 2100, we have the range of the models. The range of the models is not used to get the bars on the right-hand side of that figure, right? The, 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 the mean temperature of the models under a given forcing scenario were taken. That mean is then multiplied by 0.6 and 1.4. Basically, the, a, a range... A, a, a subjective range is formed about the mean of the 2100 model runs in order to get the actual likely range for the real world. That makes sense? Uh, Did you like the question? So what was found is that uh, <clears throat> the conclusion was that the range of models was probably too narrow because the range of trend responses in the models is less than the range assessed from other lines of evidence. So there was sort of an inflation of the model spread to come up with an uncertainty range. But that was also done in AR5, so I don't understand that point. Oh, so, 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 so the, sorry, the, the point is, okay, I was gonna try and find the graph, I won't do that. The difference is, uh, so the, so, okay, so my point here is it was stated that no adjustment, it was stated from the podium that no adjustment was needed that in the AR4, an adjustment was needed and, and the model runs were not interpreted as reflecting the distribution of what we expected. And in the AR5, we didn't need to do that, I think was the phrase. It's like different. calling the anomalies temperature. It's simply not true. I understand. But, 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 but how, do you, how, do you say, how do you say constructively that's simply not true when you have a room full of high school students and I offered to give them the page number. It was still rejected. I understand it's not true. It's that communication of science in public where we disagree on things that actually aren't disagreed on even inside the AR4 four, four or five, okay? And when we talk about, you know, physicists only this year started calling it Higgs, 
For years, they were still saying Higgs-like. Physicists are often really rather careful, even if they have six standard deviations in an experiment, a physical experiment, not a computer simulation. So I just want to walk through these. I get the sinking feeling with rank-ordered beauty contests where you're sort of normalizing by the best model or the average model. If they're all really bad, they all look about the same. If they're all really great, they all look about the same. I worry about the fact that very, very simple models give us the Cato skill in probabilistic forecasting, which is comparable to the AR5 and just beats the ensemble's models. This is work with, uh, with, with Emma Suckling, and I should have the reference to the paper. Uh, a charitable reading of the CMIP 09 documentation is difficult, but you can get an ensemble of charitable readings. The easiest way to see what they intended was to look at the, <coughs> the actual worked examples in the back and they're more or less telling you how to design a school in order to avoid exceeding 16 degrees for three nights in a row. Right, so this is actually an example from the documentation about how they suggest you use it. I think that's the easiest way to understand what it was intended as. Uh, their phrase is like, I've, I've had questions from the electricity sector in the US. What does a scientifically sound preview mean? I don't think it's in the glossary. Maybe there just wasn't time. OK, so we don't want to throw, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The baby here is the as good as it gets science that increasing so too is going to increase the temperature of the planet. I want to protect the baby. For whatever reason, we don't have, I think we, we, we don't clearly communicate what we're as good as it gets and distinguish it from things where we're not so sure. And these sorts of, these sorts of new unsupportable claims are becoming more and more and more common. Right? The, 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 things that, the things that Roman's worried about aren't one-offs. So maybe there's actually a new way forward. We could actually try a different kind of model that focuses only on empirically confirmed skill. Once we have skill out to 30 years, we're going to have a problem. But that's not the problem we have today. The point is that once the bathwater is becoming rancid, we have to save the baby. Right? There's no sense in which we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And there's going to be a sequel. So this is from our poster. It really does look to me like a, the side of one of those eggs in here. How do we communicate better next time? So I would just say more clarity regarding model fidelity, better experimental design, clearly stated before the runs are made, and certainly before they're interpreted, kinder, more pedagogical discussion styles. Not everyone has to do this, but it's nice. I really like many of Gavin's statements, I think they do try this. He's, he's extremely patient. Uh, more understand, to be more understanding with each other if we can't be nicer. Clarity on where we all, or almost all, agree, conditioned on the information, so we can have statements that X is, you know, I, I find this dissolves a lot of arguments as long as I'm only talking to one party in the argument at a time. Right? Clarity on exactly what the dispute is. So cherry picking statistics, these things just, people don't, you know, people recognize them as such. They don't tend to defend them so much if, in fact, it's a clear discussion. Just lifting the carpets and seeing what sort of aliens are underneath. I'll skip this one and just thank you. There are no mobile phones. Yes. <laughs> but I, I would just like to make one modification. If it's a question of clarification or a follow-up of clarification, sure. I'm really happy to take it at the same time. Yes? Yeah, so um, um, I, I think your headline message, the story you're telling about the sinking feeling, has nothing to do with climate science and has everything to do with the relationship between scientific communities and non-scientific communities. Now, I, I've been doing interdisciplinary research all my career. And um, I, I get that, what you call a sinking feeling, all the time when I'm talking to people from other fields. It's, well, here's, here's the headline message from a uh, finding from a piece of research we've done. I think, okay, yeah, I, I think I get it. And then I ask a few more questions. Well, what was the research method? How was that done? And I get that feeling because 
the instant thought is, oh shit, this is a hell of a lot more complex than I ever thought it would be, and I'm now going to have to spend months learning my way through the research methodology and the complexity of what's been done and how it's been done. So what you call a sinking feeling, I call a learning opportunity. That's the point where I say, okay, okay, it's my job as the outsider to learn how this is done and find out what the methodology is and what the assumptions are and so on. It's not incumbent upon the scientist to think all of the possible ways in which uh, a headline result statement could be misinterpreted okay. and head them all off at the outset. Okay. So do you believe that analysis? I, I believe that analysis does apply in many cases. I don't believe it applies in a national report where anomalies are called temperatures. Do you? When an anomaly, when a graph is mislabeled and anomalies are called temperatures, I don't believe that applies. In terms of whether it's a discussion inside the scientific community or the scientific community on the outside, my feeling, it depends on where we draw the boundaries, but certainly within people who are academic and national lab scientists, I run into this kind of misunderstanding really rather often. So it's not just a question of going outside to include funders, it's there for sure. Do you mean going to the general press? I don't really disagree with you very so, much. So just on the point of temperatures versus anomalies, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a small technical point. The IPCC reports are something of the order of 3,000 pages long. You cannot produce a technical document of that size without making mistakes. It is simply- That's not in the IPCC report, right? Oh, right, it's in another yeah. national report. I can give you emails which have been sent to the UK government two and three months before reports have come out where there's not time to change things that in word you could do with global search and replace. This issue is inside the climate community, depending on where you draw the science lines, certainly with inside the government climate, the, 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 the people who are actually funding and asking the question. All right, thank you, uh, Wayne. Let me think, actually, I was going to talk about that very point, the anomalies versus temperatures. But you're absolutely right. We should, no one should ever produce a graph like temperature analysis, temperature anomalies, and have the temperature on the axis. But you see this, but I think it should also, these things should be also be supplemented by reasons for why we think it's actually interesting to, pr to um, present temperature anomalies rather than temperatures. Because, you know, it seems to me that there's a suggestion that we should be really worried that the range of temperatures in these models was, was three degrees. But if I think about it and say, well, what the models are doing is telling us about responses to for forcings and changes, I could, could well imagine that the, the, the models are reliable about that, even if they're not getting the, the absolute temperature right. And if you say to me, well, I don't think the models can tell us what the temperature is going to be in 2100, I don't think that they can tell us too much, how much hotter it's going to be in 2100. Yeah, most people would, would actually have difficulty seeing the difference there. Okay, so I, again, I, uh, as it says on the graph, for mitigation, looking at a wide variety of Earth-like planets, which have a range of temperatures between which we think the local climates are dangerous, dangerously different, there may not be a problem at all at looking at anomalies. For looking at adaptation, we lose the laws of physics. Physics isn't invariant around zero degrees for water, right? Biology isn't invariant around 30 something where plants die. And it's teasing these things apart it's the actual, the, the, there, there are cases where anomalies for Alaska were used in worrying about permafrost, which doesn't really make sense. But for temperature, maybe we can even make that work. For rainfall and sea ice, especially sea ice, <laughs> this, this, this anomaly argument, it, it, just start, it begins to get much trickier. For very large scale averages, I'm, I'm not necessarily against it. For, it actually is extremely useful. It, it even could strengthen the case for mitigation. Even very different planets under this kind of forcing have very similar quantitative responses. But once we start zooming into places where three degree different worlds are really different worlds, we try, try, to, try to make interpretations about the hottest or wettest day in my college quad in 2083, uh, then, then, then I, I, I shift completely. And that distinction becomes very important, especially when it, just making sure there are two different things is very important. So thanks, Lenny, for as usual a very stimulating talk. A, a few few comments. Um, I mean, it's easy to criticize people for not doing well, and it's much harder for in actually doing things better. So, and I think one of the persons who impresses me is Gary, who really tries hard to be sort of clear enough in his talks. But uh, if you're in a, in a IPCC context, things are actually far less. Far less trivial. And 
not about opinions in this assessment. So if you say who and how many people said it could be above or below, you can't say that because it's an assessment of literature and it's not the opinion of the authors. Maybe that's because the process is not well so, so if I can just ask you one technical question. This idea of taking the mean and multiplying by 1.6 and 0.4, or 1.4 and 0.6, was that in the literature before the assessment started? Or was that actually come up during the assessment because until that information was brought together, there was no way to actually assess it. And it was part of the assessment. And, and under those rules, saying that there's a divergence of opinion, or even more importantly perhaps, a convergence of opinion, right? saying nothing about, well again, I don't know in this example, why no remark was made about whether it was symmetric, mostly above or mostly below. It was just silence. And it's been suggested to me that sometimes that silence was the result that there wasn't full agreement. Not that it actually wasn't that it was an assessment, simply that there, there wasn't a consensus on what else to say. And even if there was consensus, if you cannot cite the paper for it, then you can't say it. So maybe that's the way that the process is set up, but it's required. The, the second comment is that people will, gonna, will be misinterpreting the stuff. So uh, you said that was not necessary in AR5. It's simply not true. The same sort of scaling took place in AR5. Um, and it's extensively written down. And there's figures on it. And I've written it. So um, <laughs> <laughs> but if people misinterpret things, if they don't want to read and take the time to understand them. I understand. These are I, but, 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 and, so I, I agree with this. My, that's exactly why my conflict then is I have IPCC senior authors on the podium telling me something which is deeply false in front of a room full of uh, high school students, right? You know, Non-science, public, interested public science people. Do, I, do we just get into this argument which they will lose in public that, no, it's, look, it's, but here's the page number. It says this and read it to them. I mean, that's not really productive for science either. I agree it's not everyone's problem, but if you're going to be in that public science forum, you need to speak carefully the way Gavin tends to speak. You, you, need, you, you just need to think. If you're getting a question, the, the idea of immediately rejecting and saying no, it, it, it just lowers the debate on that public case in a way that I think is dangerous. I agree it's in both of them. But my, my point is I was told from the podium that it wasn't, and that was just wrong. Yeah. And then, and the third point is that there's a trade-off between being careful and clear and, and uh, and of course, you can be very careful, but then it becomes unreadable. And related to these questions of absolute temperature, there's a good example. The, the governments were asking on these temperature graphs for a second axis on the right showing changes relative to pre-industrial, because they care about these two degree warming relative to pre-industrial, whereas the model anomalies are given relative to 1986 to 2005. So they said, can you please put an axis and the take a and we said, no, we can't, because for scientific reasons, that would really not be justified. And there, there's about maybe 200 emails going back and forth, which ended up in a footnote, which is in the summary of policy, maybe, which says, using HAT 54 and its uncertainty 5 to 95 percent, the observed warming reference period 1986 to 2005 is 0.61 with a range of 0.55 to 0.67 from 1850 to 1900 and whatever other periods and reference periods. Likely ranging have not been assessed here with respect to earlier reference periods because methods are not generally available in literature for combining the uncertainties in models and observations. Adding projected and observed ranges does not account for potential effects of more biases to measure observations and for natural <laughs> interim variability during the observational reference period. See table 12.2. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, I applaud that. So I, I, I applaud long footnotes which say why you didn't do something. Right? Where I think we get into trouble is when there's, when there's a vague caption which is, gives us plausibility and deniable, deniability and we actually do it. Right? But, but I also, I sort of return to a point you made the other day, I don't think everyone has to do this. Right? I mean, it, 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 the key is that I, I think we could, well, I think we could generate better communication of science through the press and other ways going out. If people will explain, I'll find and read that footnote. Right? I'll send that footnote to the BBC reporter to say that there are things we can do and things we can't do 
and that the things we can't do, they're just trying to say more clearly what those limits are. And, and just being more accepting of people who they're not, so they're certainly anti, the, the anti-science lobby, my phrase for it, is out there and active, right? We interact with them often in the UK. But we can't blame them for everything. <laughs> right? There are lots of people who are just genuinely confused. And if we can try and walk through and show the implications of what they believe, and we try to explain to them this, maybe, you know, maybe the policymakers don't want to know the reason you can't. They just want the number for some political reason. You're stuck, right? Sorry. But we can, we can we, we just by, by, by playing nice, I think we can generate a lot better communication of the things we do know and its limitations. Oh yeah, we have uh, about two minutes and two speakers on the list, so if we could try to move as our, as our comments, questions. Okay. So I think yeah, one of the things you brought out pretty nicely is the tension in yeah. science communication, which goes like this. On the one hand, you want science to be authoritative and this to the public. And this encourages a kind of uh, simple philosophy of science. And you know, science gives us true stuff. And so the scientists come down from the mountain and say, behold, I found some true stuff. Um, this clashes horribly with the way that science actually works, where a very, very, very flourishing science, which public science is, has a huge amount of argument and a whole lot of arguments. And so this is a problem where what you want, in some sense, is the public to that you have authority. But for some reason, we do this by saying, no, no, you just have to believe the science. Um, you just, and then they get the sinking feeling, of course, as soon as they actually see any of the science in practice, which is this wonderfully messy fight. Right. So I, I, I and so, I, so my point is, one of, some of the stuff you were saying sort of suggested that you shouldn't be hearing your dirty laundry. What we shouldn't be doing is fighting in front of the public. And I think that that's not the way to go. I think maybe, perhaps, maybe the way to go is more to push. I think the mistake is in thinking that science's authority requires, you know, a simple, simple-minded idea about how No, no, I, I think that's exactly right. That's why I, I think if we actually taught science realistically much earlier, yeah. actually we taught nonlinearity. This is Bob Bay's 1976 article. It wasn't really about chaos in the logistic map. It was about trying to teach, give eight-year-olds the logistic map, so they wouldn't grow up with all the linear biases we have. <laughs> the, the Vulcan, and your, Vulcan and Neptune, these sorts of stories give you a, the ability to have a reasonable idea of what science is. Science doesn't do certainty, right? That's religion. Right? Science, but that, that doesn't mean it's useless. And, and I, you know, having that slightly more sophisticated view uh, would make it, yeah, I think, that, yeah, I think that's just right. Okay, uh, so we have a little bit left. Sure, your questions. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll phrase this as a yes now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, <laughs> maybe. Well, if you answer first, then I can change your answer to whatever I'd like it to be, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but so I mean, except for actually your last comments there about educating eight-year-olds, I mean, you largely framed this as a you know communications issue, and it, it just my question is the extent to which there are. You know, sort of institutional structural issues, you know, particularly with the IPCC. With Sorry, there's institutional structural sure. issues. You know, the IPCC is designed as you know a consensus generating organization for a particular audience, which is interested, which is essentially global negotiators interested in crafting a global agreement on what we do. And so, you know, your comments about, um, you know, maybe it's okay, you know, the difference in the temperature or coming up with, you know, say the planet is warming but not very good for adaptation. In some sense, it's very consistent with the structure, with the purpose of that organization is to inform global negotiators who are trying to come up with some consensus on, on, on mitigation. So, I mean, I know personally, whenever I'm dealing with the, my climate denier friends or anything like that, well, you know, I never actually use IPCC reports just because the whole structure of the thing is wrong. I mean, it's, it's intended for the wrong audience. Sure. It's five reports which refer back to previous reports as opposed to starting from first principles and explaining things. So, you know, I mean, I suppose, you know, to what extent is, our, and then we can always ask, you know, if we were starting from the beginning to help, you know, local, you know, resource managers adapt to climate change, would not only the institutional structure, but the scientific research portfolio look different? I mean, you know, there might be whole well, decisions. You know, so to what extent, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I suppose the question is, is 
what extent is, is are these just communication issues, or to what extent is you know the IPCC the wrong vehicle, and we should be focusing on other scientific organs, and to what extent is it, you know the way that the research is actually organized well to address yeah, so questions designed to ask, but not other questions that you're not trying to get to ask. I I I, I, I can't answer the question. <laughs> do, do you agree or not? <laughs> yes, that, that was that was that was the most <laughs> intricate yes. That was the most intricate yes or no question I've had in. Two hours. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, I, I think the issue about being in institutional constraints, this is a real problem. And again, that's one of the reasons it's very nice to be in this science to inform area. I, I, I don't suffer from I mean, I suffer from the things I don't understand hugely. Um, and then I have to go read you know, Gavin's blog posts and Judy's thoughts about that. why does she think this? And, and I, I, so, so that's a problem that if you're going to be inside those institutions, you're constrained. We've just done a big problem, a big project with the Department of Energy and Climate Change on a climate, what we would, what we would have liked to have called a climate visualizer. This is Erica Thompson, uh, which, which just allows you to turn knobs and move around inside the space explored by the IPCC graphs. Just lots and lots of interpolation. It's for the whole world. They've already done one for the UK. But the internal workings of that, negoci of that process there were lots of pushes to include very new, hot off the press model results, right? Which, but, but that's not. I mean, and there were there were pushes to be able to answer questions which we couldn't answer by interpolating positions around inside the graphs inside the AR5. And I, 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 I think those are just that's just difficult to do that. Uh, I think it takes. I think for those who want to do it, trying to form a bridge between the real communicators of science. Uh, the, as, as in the professionals, right? That, that, that's a, I find this very rewarding, but it takes a lot of time. And Anna spent a lot of Saturday doing those calculations yesterday. <laughs> so it's, it's not a, it, it's a question of where you want to put your resources. I, I think up to other people, it might be much, much better to be thinking about how to parameterize clouds better or rock, depending on what it is that we need to get in the models most quickly. So I, I think the, the institutional structures is a hard one. I believe that this idea of having sort of this actionable, credible, transparent discussion, right, after the Chatham House, mm -hmm. Chatham House hopefully uh, coming together, I think that, that, could, that would need to be outside, right? I don't, I'm not sure where, we just lost a grant to try and do it ourselves, so. Uh, <laughs> but those kinds, of, those kinds of work, if the people are willing to actually understand, and actually to answer questions on the people who talk in the public are willing to answer questions and respond in a, in a, in a, in a useful way. I think a lot of that really needs to happen outside of any real careful structure. Yes, yes. All right, well, thank you very much.